So, uh, Jonathan, you are uh, heading up tribe exploitation, and uh, yeah, and you were about to point out my background. Yeah. So, so thank you. Uh, I love your shirt. Uh, I want one, uh, <laughs> and I love what's behind you. Basket case. Frank Henenlotter's debut is an incredible fucking movie. Can I swear? Tell me, is this a family audience? You say, well, you know, it's hard PG-13. Let's just call it that. Okay, so that'll be my one swear. <laughs> I'm going to get rid of, right? Just, Isn't that PG-13? You're allowed to swear one time. Listen, just, just don't filter yourself. No. Go for it. Okay. No, no, you don't want that because I really will go for it. <laughs> um, uh, basket case is one of the pictures that we're showing um at uh, that's tribe exploitation and they don't show movies like this at the tribeca festival i don't know why and i was able to say to them you know there's a real secret history of movies in new york both the theaters grindhouse theaters and the industry and some of the filmmakers that that, that have been working in new york let's get some of them down and show some midnight movies which at tribeca is nine o'clock that's their idea of a midnight movie but that's okay and um, we're having, a, we're going to have a great time. So, so Frank Henenlotter is coming in. He's lived in the same apartment for 49 years. He's going to come and show Basket Case. Uh, Abel Ferrara, who's a brilliant New York filmmaker who's now based in Rome, is going to come in from Rome to show Ms. 45, which is an amazing movie. And a woman named Roberta Findlay, who is of the notorious Findlays, and we can talk about her. She's an incredible character and has made 70 feature films. Uh, wow. All in New York City, um, a real trailblazer. Uh, she's coming in to show a movie called Tenement, uh, which has got to be seen to be disbelieved. So it's, um, it's going to be an amazing program, and I'm hoping every one of your millions of viewers will <laughs> come and join us at the, at the Tribeca Festival this year. I, I, you know, I so wish that I could be there in person. Uh, but you know circumstances. But I, this is definitely where I'd be hanging out, um, right? Because uh, the the can you can let's talk about the significance of grindhouse cinema, what it is yeah. and what it means. I mean, like, and and why it's important that this is here finally at Tribeca. Well, there's kind of a, a, a grindhouse. They're called grindhouses, and 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 these were the old theaters. They were often inner city theaters. Um, or off the beaten track theaters. They were independent theaters. They were not owned by the studios. They were mom and pop or mobbed up theaters or somebody owned them. And they had to show something and they were showing movies to people who didn't want to spend $6 for a ticket. They wanted to spend $2 for a ticket or they were waiting for their bus or they wanted something that would excite them, something that they couldn't get. Remember, there was no videotape, there was certainly no internet. Um, if you wanted to see sex or violence or anything exciting, you had to pay, buy a ticket and go to the movie theater. You know, So there were a lot of different kinds of theaters, actually. They were not just mainstream. You know, There were no Marvel movies, action movies and things like that were actually not the mainstream. You know, if you were going to have a, an action movie, that was kind of considered usually sort of a lesser movie that was, that was closer to a grindhouse movie. So, so there were, um, uh, ever since the beginning of movies, really, when there were movie theaters, there would be people who would show something a little sexier, something a little weirder than the usual fare. And those who wanted to see something a little more extreme would seek it out and go to these theaters to see it. So... In New York City, there was a whole film industry. Mostly, the, you know, most of the studios would have an office somewhere in the city. Um, and, you know, that's how The Godfather got made in New York City, right? Paramount had an office here in New York and they came to New York and they made the movie. But there was a whole industry of people making softcore porno movies. And then when it became legal to make hardcore porno movies and put them in the theaters. That was an exploding business because there was no videotape. If you wanted Literally. to see actual sex, you had to see it with a bunch of other people. They were called like raincoat movies and they were tremendously successful across the country. You know, not just in grindhouses, but 
but you know, some newspapers would not run the advertising for an X-rated movie, and um, you know, so, some of um, some of the theaters simply wouldn't show an X-rated movie. And these movies, the movies that we call porno movies, are not really X-rated; they're triple X-rated. Yeah. In other words, yeah. right? An X-rated movie is rated X by the board that gives a G or a PG or an R or an X. That's an adults-only movie. That was, I mean, X was the old school NC seventeen. You know, right, exactly. It, right, exactly. And um, so these movies didn't bother trying to get a rating. They knew what the rating was going to be. So they <laughs> called themselves Triple X, which let you know that it wasn't just a drama with a lot of swearing and one boob too many to get an R rating. This was hardcore pornography we called Triple X movies. And that's how you came up with NC 17, was because people assumed if it had an X on it, it was porn. And an X-rated movie actually was not a porno movie. Did you guys have pussycat theaters in New York? Oh, not, not in New York. Not that I remember. I mean, there must have been. You know, because we we had them. Were. We had them out here oh, yeah. in California. And oh no, my, no, that was the high end porno theaters. Yeah, my aunt worked in one. So there you go. And that, we're not. That's a whole other story. That's a whole <laughs> other podcast right there. My aunt worked in a pussycat theater, dude. <laughs> Do you know how do you know how many people would tune in for that? Yeah, well, I mean, let's do it. But uh, let's do it. She was cool. No, Roberta Findlay tells a story. Roberta Findlay, most of her movies were were X rated movies or unrated movies, and she made a bunch and distributed a bunch of hardcore porn movies. And she's like, "Oh my God, we tried to get into the Pussycat. You know, these were like, you know, because if you were in the Pussycat theater, you were going to make some money. These mm -hmm. were very, very, very profitable theaters." Um, because the movies cost nothing to make, you know, it was a hotel room, even the, even the classier ones, it was a hotel room. And, and in between the hotel rooms, they'd have you driving in a Mercedes or something. And there'd be a shot of some porno actress sipping champagne. And then she'd get to the next hotel room and, you know, she'd in the hotel room. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is true, but, but porno and exploitation grindhouse movies are a little bit, are a little bit different. So a grindhouse movie, a grinder was essentially a theater where they would show movies all day. And, and you could just walk in at any point and it's okay because the program would take three hours, but you'd get to see the beginning and nobody was there. They didn't care about the beginning. Oh my God, let's hurry. I don't want to miss the beginning. You didn't care. You were there to spend some time and to watch some insanity, basically. You know, the audiences for this movie, these movies were passionate if they weren't asleep. And, um, um, you know, these were cheap movies made for mostly working class audiences. And they were a way to, they were called exploitation movies because they would exploit like the latest thing in the newspaper, you know, mm -hmm. cults. So there'd be movies about cults, you know, there are marijuana, the scourge, there'd be movies about kids smoking marijuana. And of course, no matter what the, what, what the story was supposed to be about, it always led to sex and violence. That's what it was. You know, is Reefer cars. Madness considered a, an exploitation? Sure, it is. That was absolutely. And, and Reefer Madness, and there was, it's a, it's a great deep cut there, Reefer Madness. People know about Reefer Madness now because somebody rediscovered it. Yeah, yeah. And it's so old and silly, right? It was literally a movie made in the 30s, I guess, called Reefer Madness and how it would drive you crazy. And you were going to, it was a gateway drug to prostitution. And, you know, and basically it was an excuse for people to, you know, watch people turning into prostitutes and getting crazy, right? It was fun. They sold it as educational. They sold it as dire. But everybody knew why they were going to see it was to see sin. And, and that movie and a lot of movies like that were called roadshow movies. It's actually interesting. I was just talking to Henenlotter about this. Um, a roadshow movie was called a roadshow because mm. the distributors would literally take the print. You know, back then there was a print. There was actual movie. Yeah, there was a physical thing. They had to. There was a physical thing that you carried around in a, in a, in a steel case to protect it. Right. And it was light sensitive. And you'd carry this steel case and it was a road show because the guys would put it in the trunk of their car and they would drive to a little town in Ohio whatever and they'd meet the theater owner and they'd say I got I got reefer madness and there's some inner thigh and they <laughs> say you know right and they smoke some weed and it's crazy and the guy would say okay and they might have to pay the local you know cop off to not bust them and they'd put posters up 
and they'd say tonight only reefer madness and people would flock to the movie theater it was a cash only business the, the theater would split it with the guy he'd throw it in the back of his car and he'd drive to the next town they made fortunes this way you know right. so those so, were roadshow movies sex right. hygiene movies famous yeah. one is called right it's called <laughs> mom and dad it sounds <laughs> innocuous enough and it was i mean literally you could watching paint dry are more interesting than these movies because they're 60 minutes of nothing the worst acting shot in the worst studio by the worst filmmakers but the last minute or two is mom actually giving birth and it was actual footage of an actual birth of a baby which meant it was an actual vagina on film right oh. the least sexy version of a vagina, but you know, it was a way of showing a, a nether parts of a woman and people went mental. They <laughs> would have, no, they went mental and they would have like men's viewings at you know this time and women at this time. You know, they were trying to, they'd sell it crazy so that, so that people would go, you know, it must be so dirty, it must be so depraved that they won't even let us watch it with the women at the same time, which of course they doubled their money. And, and, and I think, I think, Although none of this is written down because it was all cash. Somebody told me that, that Mom and Dad, which was made, I think in 1940, somebody's going to correct me, it was made way back when, before the war, made over $40 million. Wow. Grossed. Cash business. Um, so those were exploitation movies, right? And the Grindhouse was basically a place where exploitation movies got shown. Mm -hmm. And so they became either known as grindhouse movies or exploitation movies. Now I'm going to take a breath. <laughs> take a breath. Take a sip of whatever you're drinking. Um, Good, it's but, bourbon. <laughs> it better be bullet or better. So, um, so, okay, so we've got, you know, all of these salacious, you know, uh, 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 subgenres of, of films. Why? Why are you bringing this? Why, why is this worth consideration alongside, you know, the normal Tribeca fair? Yeah. Um, I, I've never been to the Tribeca Festival. I live in Los Angeles. I've been spending time here, here in New York and, and uh, got hooked up with some of the Tribeca folks. And I said, you guys are only showing kind of half the movies out there and you're not dealing with the, the true film history, I mean, the deep dive kind of film history that obviously not everyone's gonna be interested in, but is objectively interesting, right? These are interesting stories. These are, this is an interesting mm -hmm. piece of film history and the movies are incredible. Mm -hmm. Some of them are offensive. They were made in a very different time, very different sensibility. And we can talk about some of that stuff if you want, but that's also interesting to kind of excavate, you know? Mm -hmm. the gentrification of New York. New York has changed a lot. All of these movies were shot right on location with no permits. I mean, they're talking about running and gunning. You mm. know, the stories of Henenlotter filming in Tribeca as his lead actor is running naked through the streets are hilarious, you know. <laughs> and now Tribeca is like the richest part of the world, you know. You couldn't do that. If, you know, if, if, if you dreamed of it, you couldn't do it. Uh, Roberta Findlay getting arrested with Johnny Wad Holmes shooting pornos, you know. Um, I mean, these are fantastic stories. And I wanted to not only bring the stories and the filmmakers into the light of day and celebrate them, but really have a discussion with today's kind of, you know, film elite about, you know, what, what movies really are for most people. The mm. truth is that most people don't give a shit about them you know, mm -hmm. as the movies. They're kind of a religion of the last century. You know, we all speak the film language, mean a lot, television is shot in the same language as film language, or at least narrative film language. But most people don't care. They went to the movies to have some entertainment. You got two hours, let's go see what's playing. You know, hey, it's Friday night, let's go have some fun. Let's see something scary, something sexy, something exciting, something, you know, really violent. They wanted to see entertainment, cheap, hard, fast entertainment, which is what I love, you know? Mm -hmm. And as I say to people, they say, well, what's the appeal of these movies? I'm like, what's the appeal of Stephen King? You know, does every, does every movie have to be war and peace? 
right? You know, it doesn't, it shouldn't be. That's how you know what War and Peace is because no novel is as good as it. But there's a lot of other novels that are really fun and worth, you know, picking up. And sometimes you don't want to go through War and Peace. Sometimes you don't want to have a gourmet French meal. You want a hot dog and a root beer and it's really satisfying. This is the Zagnut of movies. <laughs> is what, that's the, the easy, <laughs> I like know. it. So, but you know, you, you're also, um, to, to coincide with uh, the screenings, you're also doing a, 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 a fanzine or a, a physical. Oh, yes. Okay, Absolutely. why? Well, and, you know, just give it to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm doing a fanzine, right? A zine. And, excuse me, part of the reason, one of the reasons, first reason that I came up with was somebody's going to walk into Ms. 45 or Basket Case or Tenement, which is insane, and really be offended. They're really going to say, like, I'm here at the Tribeca Festival, and this is what you think is appropriate to show? Because you know what? It's not appropriate. I mean, that's the beautiful thing. It's not, it's not, it's not nice. It's not in good taste. You know, it's in bad taste. And the truth is that there was a quote that I read that was so good. It's like, every taste is bad taste. Good taste is a residue of somebody else's privilege. Oh, what I they determine that. is good taste, right? I love that. And, you know, I, so I didn't want to trigger anybody. I have kids of my own, you know, I'm, 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 I want to be a sensitive person alive in the year. 2022 and I don't want people walking in every one of these films has rape you know that's heavy stuff and you don't you know there's no warning signal they don't start with a warning this film contains violence bad language nudity more violence and rape you know they just they didn't do it back then so I, I wanted to create some fun way to contextualize what we were going to see to talk about exactly what we're talking about, which is why, why are we showing these movies? Why are these interesting? How did they come to be? And, you know, to say to the folks who might find them exciting or worth checking out, come and check these out. You know, these are really cool. And the folks who might be triggered or might be put off, stay away. Honestly, it's, it's not going to be for you. You won't have a good time. And I don't want to, I don't want to offend you. I don't want to offend anybody. Um, I want people to have a good time, you know. Mm. So, so with that in mind, how could I contextualize it? I said, oh, maybe we can create some fun magazine, newspaper thing. I'm still not exactly sure what it's going to. Just before we got on, I was emailing with the printer because I got to print the damn. I never did anything like this, you know. It's oh. complicated. You got to lay it out. You got to print the fucking thing, you know. So, so my my child and my friend and I are going to spread all the material out and I've interviewed the filmmakers and I've culled a lot of stuff. I have a big collection of magazines and books that are mine uh -huh. and just pulling stuff together and a lot of images and a lot of ads, old fun um, ads from, from um, comic books and um, um, Warren magazines, which were famous monsters of film land and creepy and eerie yeah. comics, stuff like that. Just stuff that I kind of grew up with and we're going to throw it all together and hopefully it will excite people and not bore them to tears well if it does I, bore you put it down and give it to somebody else yeah <laughs> exactly if it's not for you leave it what exactly um, leave it alone. <laughs> yeah i i love that and i love that uh, uh in the one of the statements they sent me uh out of the interview you you uh you cite uh chris gore and film threat and uh, yeah, exactly. i i actually write for film threat now and chris is a dear friend of mine uh so oh, good just, please send him my regards he may be like who who the what i don't know no, <laughs> no. but he sent me a stack of stuff and um a, a, a while ago film threat was a big he's like a hero of mine there were guys and again this is you know back way back when yeah when when this is very I, also an interesting piece of kind of history of period you know suddenly there was videotape there were these video stores. It, it all is based on money. You know, somebody realized, wow, people will rent old movies or movies that were just in the theaters uh -huh. to watch them, maybe over and over and over. People are crazy. You know, 
that's what they thought when they said, no, no, we can do it. We can make a video cassette of this old movie mm -hmm. and people will either buy it or rent it, which was a new concept. And so these video stores popped up, mom and pop videos, and they had to fill the shelves with something, you know, because once you've read, it's like Netflix. Once you've watched them all, well, what's next? You know, that's why Netflix has to put something out every, every 16 hours, you know? So, so they would, there were new movies getting made and a lot of real exploitation grindhouse movies were made for video, essentially, made for the video stores. Um, but, but old movies from anywhere, they could put on videotape and they could put in the video store. So, so there, there were these um, people like us, you and me back then, this is what we would have done. We would have gone to the video stores, rented all the movies and written reviews of them and put out our own magazines. Right. And some of them were incredibly, fantastically funny and great. And mm -hmm. for us to figure out what we wanted to see, movies that we'd never heard of, that no one had ever heard of. And these guys would find them and write reviews about them. So Michael J. Weldon and Psychotronic Video is, I mean, he's gonna be remembered as one of the great film scholars of, of our time. No one knows who he is, but he created Psychotronic Video. Chris Gore and Film Threat, who also dealt with independent film at that time. He was one of the first people to talk about this guy, Tarantino, who's making these movies, you know. Mm -hmm. um, um, brilliant, Chris mm -hmm. Gore was. Um, there was a guy named the, um, Joe Kane, who was the Phantom of the Movies, and he was writing reviews. And he got some of the newspapers to actually pay him to write reviews of funky B movies, and he became, you know, an expert in the field. Joe Bob Briggs down in Texas. And there were, you know, a number of, of mostly guys, Video Watchdog, this guy Tim Lucas created yeah. a magazine called Video Watchdog. Anyway, so this zine is kind of an homage to, to those people as well. You know. Which is, is it, it's all part, part of the culture. It's all part of the grindhouse experience. So yeah, exactly. I thought that was super cool. Um, so you're based, you're based out in LA, but you're out in uh, Tribeca right now. Yeah. So I'm cool. Cool. They set me up in a, excuse me, in a conference room as I'm laying out all my goodies to try to put this effing zine together. I hope it will be available <laughs> online. I don't, I don't know. If, I mean, I'd love for you all to take a look at it. You know, it'll be fun. And there's, we have some guest columns. I got people to write to me about what Grindhouse means to them. And some people, like Jane Rosenthal, who runs Tribeca, is like, I think her quote is literally, I don't know about this shit. I don't know why we're talking about this shit anyway. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, Jane Rosenthal, producer, the Irishman. Whereas Jason <laughs> Blum, you know, Jason Blum wrote something really nice oh, for that's me. that's cool. Um, yeah, uh, a, a wonderful guy, good friend of mine, a guy named Nate Moore, who's part of the, what do they call the brain trust or something, you know, at Marvel, the guys who sit around the tables and, you know, the, um, the, the Illuminati over there. And they say, <laughs> what we, you know, what's going to happen in phase six. And anyway, he's one of those guys. He wrote something great for me and Oren Pelly who made um, paranormal activity. And um, anyway, I, you know, I got a, a couple of folks who were kind enough to write some, some, some fun things um, that are going to be in there. And uh, uh, a little piece about John Waters and, you know, it's just gonna be fun. Epic, that sounds so cool. Uh, I hope to be, at least be able to read a copy of it. Um, and uh, it. yeah. So, Hopefully it'll be online on the Tribeca yeah, yeah, yeah. The website is what I'm saying. If not, think, I'll try to get you a copy. I'm hoping oh, they're gonna sell like hotcakes and I don't even have a copy left. No, but no. You probably, to... I'm probably gonna have a stack of shit like Chris Gore does in his garage. <laughs> make, make your money. If you could sell it, do no, it. No, no, there's no money. No, no, no money. I'm no? not getting paid. We're not going to charge people. No, we're going to use. Oh, materials. I thought you said you were selling. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, it was a joke. Selling like oh. hotcakes. No, no, it's we're not going to sell it. Figure speech. A figure Copy speech. That. Forgive me for for using it poorly. No, no, there's no money involved. It's just the labor of love. Excellent, excellent. The labor excellent. of stupidity. Okay, you <laughs> talk now. I keep I keep just running on in the mouth. Well, no, that's it. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew about this because it's cool, man. It's important. So thank you. You know, it's going to um, be great. When, like, uh, where, where can people see these movies? What are the screenings? Can you tell me? Okay, in New York, yeah, you have to go to the Tribeca site. I wish I had a link, but you probably can get one because I could you've put it been in dealing there. with the, 
folks will take you. So if you guys are interested, and these are free screenings, you just, you do have to sign up for them, but they're free. I'd love for you to come. Thursday, the 9th of June, we're showing Ms. 45 and Abel Ferrara, who is unbelievable storyteller and hilarious guy, uh, is going to be there presenting Ms. 45, which is a really great movie. Um, the following Thursday, the 16th, uh, Roberta Findlay, who is incredible um, and a brilliant storyteller. And we'll talk about getting arrested and the death of her husband and all sorts of, which is an amazing story. Um, and then the following night is Friday, the 17th, is Frank Hammingladder and Basket Kids, who Excellent. is absolutely brilliant guy and knows more about these movies than anybody alive. And I mean, anybody alive. <laughs> Do you mean anybody alive? I mean, there are people who are dead who <laughs> might know more than him, but they're dead. <laughs> This guy, Frank Henninlatter, he's like, oh, no, no, uh, gir gir girl, mall, mall club. I'm like, what? No, girls, girls gone crazy. That was 1957. Oh, my God. I'm like, what the hell? What? what? Yeah, no, he's like, yeah, he knows. Anyway, he knows movies that no one should. I mean, you need that you need shots to watch. He knows. Wow. Well, uh, Jonathan, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for chatting up. Uh, tribe exploitation and uh, my pleasure man thanks for fighting the good fight and doing the good work and bringing the word of horror we need it i love it oh, check we... out i wrote a book or co-wrote a book called horror cinema from tashin um you can get it on get a cheap copy go and buy a used copy i know please because i don't get any more money from tashin so you know my money's been made so buy it as cheap as you can i co-wrote it with a guy named stephen j schneider who's a wonderful writer and uh, it's not a bad book <laughs> um, otherwise, otherwise, come and see these free screenings, and we'd love to see it. Come and come and say hey. Roberta has donated some posters. If you come to see Tenement, maybe you'll get a signed poster from Roberta Finley. Oh wow, that's cool. Okay, dude. Well, uh, best of luck on these screenings, and uh, make sure to send me your information. I'll send you a shirt. My pleasure. Great All talking. Right, Bye, everybody. Take care.